in international organizations, people come, people go, they get assigned, they get uh, moved on, they're sent here by their capitals, they're moved on to other postings, and NATO is just one part of their professional uh, career. But there is one person for whom NATO uh, has been a home for 38 years, a working home for 38 years, a name you will know all, of course, it's Jamie Shea. So remember what we started off the day looking at, what is the new normal? Well, the new normal for NATO is that Jamie Shea will no longer be uh, a member of the international staff from the end of September. So NATO has decided to create a video record of him and what those he worked with and for, um, including journalists, when he was uh, the spokesman, what they thought of him and some of the stories, not all of them, I have to say, some of the stories of Jamie uh, at work. Um, so we've got a 23-minute video which reflects on Jamie because there are those who thought that Jamie ran NATO, um, certainly during the Kosovo War. So uh, this is a small and modest tribute. Uh, he is here, but unusually he's being a bit backward about coming forward. Um, so after the video, uh, he's going to be joining Christina Gallick, who is uh, leaving to become the uh, commissioner for the Agenda 2030 in the Kingdom of Spain from next week. She's at the European Union, her last day today. So Jamie is here, but I'm introducing the video. Um, I can see him there. He sneaked in, so you are backward. There are three or four things I want to bring to your attention, so listen very clear, closely. First of all, at one point in his career, he was described as one of the fifth sexiest men in the world. <laughs> A big NATO issue, that. Uh, secondly, you'll hear him and you'll see him packing up and he's appealing for a personal assistant. And uh, as he has just said to me, he has been enveloped by NATO for the last 38 years. He's got to do things like buy an iPhone and work out how to do things which don't involve sitting in an office and supplied with everything by NATO. There are two more things to look out for. You will see a young Boris Johnson when he was a, a, a correspondent for the Daily Telegraph, and it could be that uh, you will mention that, Jamie. And finally, the most amazing thing from my point of view, you'll see at the end the use of a drone camera inside the NATO compound as Jamie drives away in his 16-year-old Jaguar. So that's the background to the film. It's a complete handbrake turn. Jamie and Christina will be here shortly in 23 minutes. But first, let's run the video. This is Jamie Shea, and today, he's late. When Jamie joined NATO nearly 40 years ago, he started near the bottom. But in the many roles he has served since then, he's often had a front row seat on history. Since he joined NATO in 1980, Jamie has lent a lot of colour to this unbeautiful but functional building. He's one of NATO's real characters. Uh, hi there, Paul. Sorry to keep you waiting. When I inherited it, it was down there. And the only thing, Paul, that I've done in the last uh, uh, seven plus years in this office is pour uh, black coffee dregs into it. This plant has never had any pure drinking water, purely NATO standard black coffee. And look how it's done. But as well as charisma, Jamie has also brought many talents to NATO. He has a doctorate is a lecturing professor and prolific writer, speaks several languages, can talk as easily about obscure NATO facts as the fortunes of his favorite football team, Tottenham Hotspur, and has become part of the very fabric of NATO. Jamie is packing up and leaving NATO's old HQ, like everyone else, as the organization moves to the new building over the road. But for Jamie, it is different. He's leaving NATO for good as he retires this year. Jamie's late today and he admits the punctuality has been a challenge over the years. 
I apologise for being a few moments late. His timekeeping became even worse than it used to be. As he packs, Jamie is doing what he does best, telling stories. If colleagues were late for a staff meeting, or it was happy hour on a Friday afternoon, you could either shout along the corridor or you could and they soon got the message. Jamie's a natural explainer, and that means he talks a lot. He's always incredibly impressive, but quite difficult to stop talking. <laughs> the third element is the sanctions idea. Sorry, I'm speaking too long here, I know. But, 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 but. You could see their faces thinking, when is this guy going to stop talking so they'll serve us something to eat? And then finally, international law. This is the fourth element. But it wasn't always like this. Jamie arrived at NATO in 1980 as a minute writer. Margaret Thatcher was a rookie prime minister, and President Carter had called for a boycott of the Moscow Olympics before losing the US presidential election to Ronald Reagan. The world was different then, and so was NATO. I came as a minute writer. I had been with Jamie at a minute writer's test in 1979, and he came here before I did. And I arrived and we were sharing the office together, and he taught me what I needed to know at the beginning about minute writing. But Jamie would arrive in the morning usually full of beans, full of energy, full of coffee. Um, and I remember more than once he would go to the security cabinet, take out what he'd recorded the previous day with a great flourish, wipe the disc completely clean, and then say, where was I? And I would say, I think you've just wiped all that you did yesterday afternoon. But such was Jamie's energy. In a few minutes, he was back to where he was again. A young second secretary, I found, uh, I found a NATO uh, which was uh, much more quiet uh, than it is now. It was the Cold War, so it was not a safe world, but it was much more predictable. With a secretary general uh, called Joseph Luntz, uh, who was driving around in a uh, almost British racing green Rolls Royce. The work was also very different to Jamie's expectations. I, in fact, was a, an assistant committee secretary and a minute writer sitting on some rather boring committees to do with the quality of tarmac or, on airfield runways and pipelines. And I was forever complaining to my wife that this wasn't the image that I had of a career at NATO. Jamie soon moved on to overseeing NATO's youth programme. But it was a difficult time to be doing this, with many youth supporting the anti-nuclear movement. And he, at the time, poor sod, was running uh, the NATO Youth Programme, um, which was you know, probably the, the, the assignment from hell, given how unpopular NATO was in youth. Uh, and then he graduated to dealing with the Women's Institute from Nuneaton and, you know, sort of uh, citizen groups. Jamie was still not working in NATO communications, and it showed. The actual NATO spokesman at the time was a Portuguese diplomat called Mr. Nuno de Campos, uh, who was known to all the journalists as No News de Campos. But the changing of the guard at the top led to a realisation. NATO needed to work on its image. Peter Carrington came in as the Secretary General, very aware of NATO's image problem, very keen to uh, do something about it. For the first time, Jamie was asked to use his communication skills, mainly in speech writing. And it came just as the world was going through major changes. And very soon, Jamie would be in the room as more historical events unfolded. This was the moment uh, and when uh, Afsanievsky after was asked to stop the meeting because he'd had to get on the phone to Moscow early and we all stood up and we all milled around for half an hour thinking, what's this? And he came back with a Russian flag took away the Soviet flag, planted the Russian flag on and said, I'm now the ambassador of Russia. I'm no longer the ambassador of the USSR. It ceased to exist 10 minutes ago. Well, I started my work day, my first work day, on the day the Warsaw Pact dissolved. So when I arrived here, uh, some people were sort of quipping, don't even bother settling down uh, because now everything is changing and who knows what's happened to NATO. Now that the enemy has disappeared, isn't it natural that people start asking questions uh, about uh, well, whether there's a real purpose in staying together? Secretary General Werner wanted a strong communicator as his spokesman to deal with these questions and he was prepared to break a tradition to make sure it was Jamie. People were used to have SecGens choose people from their own country. And so a German uh, suggests saying, I want a British uh, spokesman and, and I want this particular person, uh, that was quite a shock for some. 
Um, but Werner later, um, before his death, told me that this had been his best personnel decision ever. Jamie worked closely with Werner. When the Secretary General became gravely sick, the two pushed on together on two major initiatives. Werner tried to fix uh, the Balkan mess. He also tried to bring Russia closer. Uh, and these were, this all happened in a very short period of time. So Werner just had to continue uh, to be the figurehead uh, until I think these things were sort of brought to a, to a conclusion. I think that kept him alive. Um, and uh, Jamie did his best to support Werner in this very, very crucial moment. Werner finally lost his battle with cancer. NATO action ultimately led to the end of the Bosnian conflict, but it had been a slow and depressing process. Basically, the story of Yugoslavia was that everything had to get worse before it, 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 it got better. Let's be honest and frank about it. And you know, Nobody today would have said that Yugoslavia was a textbook case of crisis management by EU, NATO, the international community more generally. To some degree, it took the collapse of the UN mission, UMPRO 4, after the Srebrenica massacre in July 1995 to create the circumstances, you know, no more UN potential hostages on the ground for NATO, US and Europe to start acting decisively and run a, 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 an air campaign. But it was really, really you know, like arguing about the shape of a table, a sign of the petty politics and the point scoring at a time when these countries have been hollowed out by war and ethnic cleansing and war crimes and you know there was an immense task to be doing and, and getting on with it and the fact that they could waste half their day as I say on these kind of silly protocol issues was was a, was a bit uh, depressing. One of the few positives of the Bosnian conflict was that Russia had worked well with NATO in trying to bring peace to the region. The Russians were part of the contact group and actually were at the Dayton peace negotiations working with Richard Holbrook uh, helping shape uh, that deal. NATO now wanted to formalize that good relationship whilst also preparing to enlarge with new members, a delicate balancing act. You had to have a, a better relationship with Russia. You had to associate Russia somehow to this new emerging architecture. You cannot simply bank uh, uh, entirely on NATO enlargement. There's, there must be something else. And during that period, efforts were made both by NATO and by the United States to try to find a way to square the circle, to create a partnership with Russia that could be established in parallel with uh, the enlargement of NATO membership, and we could all live happily ever after. A risk which was uh, intrinsic to the process is that the two had to appear totally separated. Jamie was uh, present with the media, conveying what was going on. Jamie would contribute especially to the communication. He was always thinking, of how that could be translated outside. When NATO and Russia signed the Founding Act in 1997, it was time to celebrate a new understanding. After the last uh, session of negotiation with the Russians, Primakov was going into hospital after to have an intervention, so uh, I said, I know he likes brandy, so send him a very good uh, bottle of Tomek brandy, so he, he got that to him in the hospital and he said, I don't know if it's the most appropriate uh, uh, present for a person who is in bed. But it was not long before a return to violence in the Western Balkans would change many lives, including Jamie's. NATO headquarters was invaded by journalists of every nationality from all over the world. I think we were not prepared at all. NATO wasn't ready. There was no structure. Um, which is not meant as a criticism because we never thought we would ever end up in a situation like that. We just had to improvise. Mm, I learned a lot from that period, a lot. We had journalists uh, staying for 24 hours uh, in the corridors. But one of the problems was that a lot of them weren't military experts. They knew nothing about NATO. This is an evolving situation. And as soon as we have something, we'll share it with you on that. Jamie was walking a fine line between what the journalists wanted and what uh, NATO and specifically the military were willing to talk about. And there was always that sense that he might be slightly interpreting what he knew. But um, he was fantastic at what I call filling the space with credible and verifiable information. You know, you need that depth of trust um, when, the, when the man hits the ventilator. What I remember and realize now is that 
much of it was quite a lonely, risky job. Everyone had hoped the campaign would be a short one. People were very tired. I remember doing uh, two 72-hour shifts and then going on camera live afterwards to report. It was, it was horrendous. We were all in exhausted. It took a toll on all the team that uh, was working, I remember, a, an average of 17 hours a day. On an occasion when Jamie realised there was one, one place he simply could not be, and he said, um, I tell you what, um, tell them my grandfather's died and I have to go to his funeral. And uh, so that was that for a few moments, and then Jimmy rushed back in and said, no, don't do that, that's what I told them the last time, we'll have to think of something else. <laughs> Jamie Shea played a key role in, as the face of NATO in explaining NATO's purposes, laying out the, uh, the rationale for, for action, and steadying the nerves of uh, many of the Allied capitals. I, I think that was def definitely NATO's coming of age moment. I've never seen a more clear case of one individual in a way pulling the organization along than Jamie during the Kosovo crisis. Finally, after 78 days, NATO's conditions were met and the campaign ended. As the peacekeepers went in, it still wasn't an easy situation to communicate. On the ground, when the NATO troops were coming in, and also the Russian troops were landing. There were difficult days, and for Jamie, they were also difficult because uh, media were asking many questions. But then came the visit to Kosovo. Probably the best that uh, uh, Jamie, the Secretary General, and those that led that extraordinary operation could get was to see the welcoming hands of the Kosovars when he visited Kosovo and walked down the street in Pristina like a hero because people thought he was NATO. Solana and Jamie were uh, up uh, on the shoulders of people in the streets. Uh, it was like uh, receiving uh, heroes. Jamie was suddenly a global face. That's when he basically became the poster boy for NATO. He got tons of emails, tons of letters. Um, not all of them positive. Oh, uh, yours contemptuously. Yeah, there, sorry, there is one there, yeah, you <laughs> But I'd say the majority of them extremely complimentary. Many love letters, some of them even offering him marriage, uh, or at least a blind date, or, you know, a romantic type of activity. Jamie was elected the uh, fifth sexiest man al alive by the magazine Elle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I said to him, God, you're, gonna, you're so famous, you could, you'll be able to name your price. You could go to any giant company you like, you know, aren't you lucky? And I bumped into him a short time afterwards. He said, you know, you still haven't had a single offer. <laughs> the year after the Kosovo campaign saw events in the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia cause concern that conflict in the region was starting again. A lot of people believed, with some justification, that it could easily degenerate in the way that Bosnia and Kosovo uh, had done. Deep ethnic uh, tensions, lots of guns flying around, hotheads on all sides who were only too willing uh, to, to have a go. Javier Solana, my predecessor, but also the EU's high representative and I got together, decided that we really had to do something about this before it got out of control. And over that year, I think we were there 11 times in Skopje. You know, the combination of the two of us, you know, uh, the smooth uh, Spanish ex-foreign minister and the rather blunt speaking uh, Scottish uh, Secretary General perhaps produced the chemistry that helped in that situation. The problem is, is that nobody wrote about it because, uh, uh, you remember, if it bleeds, it leads. And fortunately, this didn't bleed. Uh, but unfortunately, as a result, it, it, it didn't lead either. Miles and miles of sunshine, Miles Davis. We're going to put Miles out there today, nice as it could be across the northeast. Uh, rough seas still uh, from, the, uh, from the chop from that hurricane, but other than that, it's kind of quiet around the country. We were interrupted by one of my uh, protection team coming in with a note. A few minutes later, he came in and said another uh, plane had attacked. So we knew it was something big. So the lunch was abandoned uh, and uh, we got back into cars, right back to NATO headquarters. 
I listened to the BBC World Service on the radio. The enormity of what was happening uh, was obviously becoming apparent to the world. This was the, you know, the Hollywood science fiction film that everybody thought would always be science fiction uh, happening in reality. You know, the, the, uh, the, the horror of it, the daring do, but, but also a sense that you know, this was something new. If it is determined that this attack was directed from abroad against the United States, it shall be regarded as an action covered by Article 5 of the Washington Treaty. So who was behind activating Article 5? We put the statement to the, uh, to the council, I think it was half past three in the afternoon. Uh, half past nine, we had the final yes from the final uh, government. And to use all my political skills, I have to say, but uh, we got the decision and now everybody is the, uh, is the godfather of the idea. It was a brilliant idea. A new Secretary General arrived and immediately had to oversee an operation designed to fight those behind 9-11. And it was to become NATO's biggest ever, ISAF in Afghanistan. It was a lot of learning by doing, of course, because such, such a major operation NATO had never done before. One of the problems uh, NATO was facing, uh, understandably, was that every nation uh, was looking to Afghanistan through a straw. And for the Dutch, Afghanistan was Uruzgan, and they were looking through that straw to Uruzgan. Uh, the, the Brits were in Helmand, the, the Canadians were in Kandahar. Uh, that made coordination uh, not a simple business. The Hopskeffer was looking to coordinate a much larger NATO too. That when I arrived in 2004, January, we had 19 allies, and when I left in, in 2009, uh, there were 28. There were already hints that relations with Russia were not going in the right direction. The moment that Putin decided uh, to nominate Dmitry Rogozin as the ambassador of NATO, I know that I then thought things might go wrong here. When he made his first appearance and paid me a courtesy visit with a, with a huge axe, uh, a very nice but enormous axe from Siberia, and said, Secretary General, I'll never forget that, I'll come to bury the hatchet. Uh, well, the hatchet wasn't buried then. And at the end of the day, my wife said, I don't want that axe in our, 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 our tiny uh, townhouse in The Hague, so I, I left it in Brussels. Against this background of myriad challenges, Jamie was a valuable source of advice. If I didn't know exactly what to do or what to decide, there was always a telephone and I could always, uh, always ring, not the Oval Office in the White House, but Jamie Shea. I, I remember very, very vividly the first time we traveled to Kosovo together, of course, where, where, he's, where he's a hero, uh, uh, that we, we landed at Pristina Airport and, 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 and loud cheers for Jamie and they were asking, who, who's, the, who's that guy? deplaning next to Jamie, uh, said, no, I'm sorry, I'm only the Secretary General. Jamie soon moved to his final post as number two in NATO's Emerging Security Challenges Division, which looks at areas from cyber to energy security and from counter-terrorism to science projects. We were given by the back then Secretary Generals the leeway to become a little bit more risky, a little bit more creative. As Jamie prepares to leave NATO HQ, how will things change for him? <laughs> well, I think Jamie at some point perhaps need to think about hiring his personal assistant. Uh, hang on a second. One thing I did look out today, though, is... Uh, uh, what do I do with them? Organising his... Yeah, multiple activities will be a little bit of a challenge for him. But with NATO and Jamie so tied together, many things will probably not change. And that will suit them both. Even though he's not uh, a computer nerd, <laughs> uh, I think his you know, hands down uh, approach to explaining complicated things in a clear and simple way is an art that we always need to be reminded of. There is no better person than Jamie Shea now to get on the road and tell people why it matters to them. Their safety and security is tied up with NATO. He epitomizes what NATO is, and I hope that's what he's gonna do in his retirement. I have never in my life here at NATO met anyone else who was more convincing, more compelling, more informed, uh, more up to par intellectually to talk about NATO than Jamie. 
I don't think Jamie could go anywhere because he, he is NATO, isn't he? Jamie equals NATO. Jamie is NATO. Uh, I almost say NATO is Jamie. That might be, might be a bit far-fetched. Regardless of what Jamie does next, he leaves behind many people who enjoyed working with him, despite him talking a lot, or maybe because of it. He never treated anybody as if they were an idiot for not knowing. He was very calm and, and was prepared to explain things over and over again. He, he's uh, a, a unique combination of a uh, political analyst and, and public diplomacy genius. The Secretary General could not do without Jamie. He was the spokesman, an extraordinary person, an extraordinary professional. By dint of being so much more than a spokesman, he's done NATO an extraordinary service. He was also a genuine human being. You know, you believed Jamie Shea. I think of all of the weapons that NATO has deployed since 1949, Jamie has probably been among the most effective. So now you see NATO's new recruitment video for <laughs> incoming members of the international staff. Please give us your candid uh, feedback uh, on that. Will it cut the mustard? No. Now, thank you. Uh, 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 before I turn to Christina, please, uh, all of you, thank you, first of all, for staying uh, uh, for that. Thank you for indulging me uh, by staying for that and being prepared to look at it. Um, it was about me, but through me, it was also about all of the history that we're leaving behind in that unprepossessing building over the road, which would never be a tourist attraction like the Tower of London or the Chateau de Versailles, but where some great historical moments, some big crises were overcome, some great personalities uh, acted, and I hope that through me, uh, even though that place will be bulldozed, uh, some of the spirit of the alliance that was formed there over 50 years uh, will be uh, uh, preserved. Uh, thank you also uh, to the uh, Public Diplomacy Division for being crazy enough to actually <laughs> decide to do that. Uh, egocentricity uh, aside, that it was not my idea, uh, believe me. Uh, thank you also to the four organisers of this conference, also for being prepared uh, to slot that in. Uh, and I hope that whatever you thought of it, after a hard day's graft of some important issues, uh, it added a somewhat lighter touch uh, to finish uh, this uh, very, very heavy day uh, before uh, that you prepare for, uh, of, of course, tomorrow. Finally, uh, I've been a foot soldier at NATO. I haven't been the Secretary General. The heads of state and government had plenty of opportunities to nominate me, but they <laughs> passed up every single one, uh, and now it's too late. Uh, and today at your conference, ladies and gentlemen, you, of course, have had all of the superstars of the uh, Secretary General, the heads of state and government, the Prime Ministers, the Defence Ministers, Foreign Ministers, many other uh, leading personalities. But what I hope that that uh, illustrates, the documentary illustrates, and Christina was there with me and so many others are here today, uh, is that NATO also operates with the foot soldiers, the working level, the dedicated people who are there day and night, who often don't get uh, the recognition that the superstars get, uh, but who write the communiques, who implement the programs, who gather the intelligence, who prepare the Secretary General for all of his trips. And so I, today, want to be uh, simply, on everybody's behalf, a representative of the foot soldiers, and I'd like, to, again, to thank the four organisers uh, for recognising us in that effort. 
finally, many of you here today had the kindness uh, to participate uh, in the video, um, and I'd like to thank you very much for resisting the temptation uh, to tell the truth, uh, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, you weren't too ashamed by the result. Thank you again, everybody, and I now pass to Christina. Well, there is something wrong in the video, and it's the first slide, or the first, it says, behind the lines. Jamie, you've been in the front line, and you've done such an extraordinary work that we are here so uh, moved to be saying goodbye to you, but you've always been in the front line. Although you've done it so well that people perceived you were behind, you were always there. Tell us, on these 40 years of NATO, in which moments you thought you were not going to make it? Well, uh, you know, NATO is a very strong organization, Christina, but it's also a fragile uh, organization mm -hmm. because when NATO was created, uh, unfortunately, it did not uh, eliminate from international politics, populism, nationalism, uh, politicians who uh, uh, believe that ideas that have failed every single time they've been tried in the past somehow are going to succeed if they're tried in the present or, or in the uh, uh, future. Uh, uh, what NATO offered was a, a structure to manage those issues uh, and problems both from without uh, and from within. And Edmund Burke, uh, the great uh, Irish political philosopher uh, at the time of the French Revolution, said that uh, uh, frenzy uh, uh, and fury uh, can pull down in half an hour more than foresight uh, and deliberation can build up in 100 years. Uh, and that is particularly true. So NATO is both strong and both fragile. And I think what you see from that particular video is the fact that uh, ultimately uh, it's not the nations that hold NATO together. It's often the international civil servants, it's the secretary generals uh, in the way that it shows how the crisis in Macedonia mm -hmm. was handled by Javi Solana and George Robertson at the time, or the crisis in Iraq was handled by Anders Fogh Rasmussen, or getting NATO in Af into Afghanistan by Yabda Hubskefa uh, and others. So we are always having to rebuild this alliance, reforge the uh, alliance uh, uh, anew. Every generation has to pick up the task uh, of, 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 of doing this uh, and, and rebuild that structure. And I think that's a sort of a lesson for the presence as, as well. NATO does not function on automatic uh, pilot. I think the second thing, very briefly, is that many people say, oh, NATO is the longest alliance in history. No, it's unique. There's never, ever, ever before in history been something like NATO, uh, which is both a defence and deterrence organisation, an organisation to establish international rules and norms, an organisation to forge uh, security partnerships, an organisation to allow small countries to have a, a voice at the, uh, uh, at the table, an organisation which is good in bad weather for going on the defensive, like now, but an organisation politically which goes on the offensive, as we did when the Berlin Wall comes down, and opportunities come along to build a better world. So it, it's not something that's existed in history before, and it's not something, if we destroy it, which will ever, ever, ever again, in the course of human history, ever be recreated. And we have to recognize that uh, uniqueness. Uh, one thing that uh, struck me uh, when I was in the uh, Imperial War Museum a couple of months ago on a rainy day in London, good place to go on a rainy day in London <laughs> is the Imperial War Museum, and they had an exhibition of cartoons of the Second World War. And there was a cartoon of 1945 by a, a famous British cartoonist called Philip Zek, where he showed a, a Tommy coming back from the Middle East, tired, you know, he's been away for four years, he hasn't seen his family, and as he gets off the ship, he's greeted by the local mayor, and he says to the local mayor, don't lose it again. In other words, because you guys lost the peace, look at what my generation had to go through, and I think that is a great sort of symbol for NATO, don't lose it again. And with your perspective, today, the beginning of the summit, quite chilly, what do you take? Well, I, I think that in these kind of situations, the first thing is to stick to what we've agreed to mm -hmm. and pay less attention to the political rhetoric, even if that's something that the press and media uh, are going to uh, uh, look at. Uh, you know, some uh, wit once said about Wagner's music, it's better than it sounds. Um, and to some degree, <laughs> I think that's a symbol of NATO today, because the paradox is, the paradox is, is that at a time when we're having so many doubts about the alliance at the political level, 
we've probably come up with a communique today, which I hope you've read, mm -hmm. which in my opinion is the most substantive, you know, there are 50-odd deliverables, the most complete, the most consensual in all different areas that we've had. You know, NATO is building up in the east, it's coping now more with better with hybrid warfare, with the cyber stuff, the domestic front. Uh, it's now finally stepping up its efforts in the, in the south as, as well. And, you know, if I were President Trump going to bed tonight and deciding, you know, to have a whiskey before going to sleep, and thinking, well, I'm going to read the communique. You know, if you look at what we say about North Korea, if you look at what we say about Iran, if you look about what we say about Iraq, stepping up in Afghanistan, dealing better with uh, uh, counter-terrorism, the burden-sharing debate, if I'm President Trump, I think, God, my God, this is yeah. music to my ears. This really does push the alliance in the direction of being useful to me on all of my foreign policy uh, uh, initiatives. So the conclusion is, is that we've got to tell this story better in the United States, and we've got to show that NATO is much more about burden sharing, uh, and that ultimately, even those people who pay more than others in NATO still benefit massively more in terms of security than they would uh, in a different world where they have to go it alone. So all goes to what you know the best to tell the story. Yeah. You are the best storyteller about NATO. But uh, you lived very tricky moments during the Kosovo Wars between the story, the information, and the spin. Is there a connection between the spin and fake news? Well, the, 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 the problem I think we have today is that uh, our political leaders have to uh, set the first standard by themselves not indulging in any fake news. Uh, because uh, if we have political leaders who excoriate the mm -hmm. press uh, or the profession of journalism or mm -hmm. talk about the fake news media simply because that media sort of disagrees uh, with their particular uh, uh, opinion, if we increasingly live in a society where people who falsify their CVs or, or whatever uh, are given a free pass, if we ourselves uh, start uh, uh, conveying the impression that truth is relative, uh, truth can be what you uh, believe, or that if you tell lies, it simply doesn't matter, then we are creating an environment where ad adversaries, of course, will be able to play on this uh, much more. So I think the first thing is, like charity begins at home, discipline begins at home, when we hold in democracies our own leaders and everybody uh, to account when it comes to accuracy. There was a, a very famous judge in the US Supreme Court, Oliver Wendell Holmes, who said, Everybody is entitled to their own opinion, but everybody is not uh, entitled uh, to their own uh, uh, facts. The great, again, the great paradox is never have we believed in a wo uh, lived in a world in which there is a greater sum of human knowledge uh, around than at the moment, and it's easier for people to get access to that human knowledge, the sort of glass fishbowl world, and never before have we had a public which is so willing to discount that knowledge and believe in fake news and believe in fake uh, uh, narratives. But the, the, the first thing, to my mind, particularly with the social media companies and the whole debate at the moment, is to hold them for much, much, much more rigorous standards when it comes to clearing up fake news on their websites, to discounting it, uh, to have al you know, algorithms, to fact-checking, uh, and, and all of those things. Because, frankly, you cannot have a democracy if the public do not share an agreed concept of the truth. Mm. Your conviction and the manner you practice informing accurately and informing about very difficult issues uh, in the manner you did, as transparent as, as, as you could, and it's seen in the video, uh, is a remarkable uh, event. I lived through those, those, those months, those, those years, where you, uh, in the, one of the most difficult moments during the Kosovo War, you really uh, tried, and I think you got the trust of so many uh, around uh, this place. Uh, and I think you should be uh, definitely continue to be praised as an icon. You have to write those times uh, about, do you plan to do so when you now will have more time? Uh, well, the, the sort of kiss and tell story yeah. about uh, NATO, uh, uh, if you like everything you wanted to ask but never dared to. No, I'd, I'd like to, but I also acknowledge, Christina, that I lived in a much simpler age. CNN ruled the airwaves, you remember. Yes. Uh, you, every country had defence correspondents who were very knowledgeable. Yes. If you could speak some to... Some of them around Some here. of them are here, thank God. Yes, not everybody yes. has died out yet, uh, or is retiring <laughs> like me. And, and therefore, you could get 
your message out much more easily speaking to a very much smaller group of people uh, because elites were essentially trusted uh, to produce top-down communication. I'm the first person to acknowledge that we're in a very different uh, environment these days where everybody can create their own news, create their own blogs, create their own websites, and in a media where opinion yeah. is much more interesting than facts and factual reporting. Uh, so I'm not suggesting that you can simply transfer my experience back in the 90s to what we've uh, done today. But the, the key thing, the key thing is that we have to be able to uh, gain over time a reputation for trustworthiness, for accuracy and honesty. Because I honestly believe in the counter-revolution after the revolution, and I think there will come a time when people, particularly young people, will start getting irritated with fact new false news, be more demanding, will not want their data to be freely given away without their uh, uh, yeah. permission, uh, will start becoming more demanding about the quality of the products they read. Uh, we just have to get through this period in a way which still allows us to produce the truth when that inevitable counter-revolution kicks in. I'm afraid I'm getting signals that we have to cut this conversation down, but I don't want to, to do it without asking you very briefly. Tell us, what are your feelings about the strategic and security environment of uh, NATO and Europe from those moments you started now? Well, for most of my career at Quickly. The, very brief, most of my NATO <laughs> career, Christina, you didn't see this necessarily from the video, but I used to have one map up in the office, you know, the yes. Fulda Gap, uh, Bosnia, Afghanistan. Today, of course, it's the map of the world because NATO for the first time is operating on three fronts. Mm -hmm. The East, a classical conventional mm -hmm. defense deterrence exercise. The South, where it's all about partnerships and stability ability building and trying to be effective at the margins and the world of the, where data has become a more precious yes. commodity and where the strategic front is the perception in the minds of our publics. And to be successful in the 21st century, NATO can't fight on one front. It has mm -hmm. to fight successfully on all three fronts. If we fail at, uh, at one, even if we succeed on the other two, we'll be less secure. So it's the most challenging period in the history of NATO. But for those who see my promotional video and who sign up for a NATO contest, contract tomorrow, it's definitely going to be, from an intellectual point of view, the most challenging and the most exciting period that NATO has ever lived through, where the stakes of failure and success have never been higher. And you will be on the front line again, doing all this outreach, all this uh, amazing work, probably from academia and many other places. That, will, that is what you're going to be doing? When I, the only thing I know how, what to do is to talk. Uh, henceforth, I have to do it for nothing, <laughs> but I will still be talking. Thank you very much to Jamie, everybody. Jamie, the man that, that serves so many secretary generals, he could have been the secretary general, but no secretary general would have been able to do <laughs> what he's done for NATO. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks very much. Thank you very much indeed. I mean, this was probably the best wrap up we could have imagined, but I still want to have another three minutes of all of you, and I would like, like to ask our Polish, a Polish colleague to the okay. uh, stage here, because I was really impressed by your remarks early on, and you asked us to be more critical with our guests. So what's your take on today? You. How did we do? First of all, it's a complete surprise. I was just asked five minutes ago to come well. here. Uh, <laughs> but I think, you know, two things, a positive and a negative. Uh, first, uh, we are all here firm NATO believers. So I think we need two things. First of all, inspiration, and second of all, honesty. I think we had elements of inspiration here. The, the meeting with the Macedonian prime minister, absolutely inspirational. The fact- What Damien said just, sometimes we need the outsiders to understand why we, to, that's to, one to of the, really the sentences which also will stick with me. To appreciate what we yeah. have or where we are and that other wants to strive uh, to have uh, where, where we are, to be where we are already. But also seeing Jamie, you know, I think extremely inspirational to see people devoting their lives to the idea of NATO. But I would also be critical. Uh, I think what I said uh, in the afternoon is uh, we cannot afford right now to be politically correct. We need to see the problems within 
ourselves. And it's not within maybe NATO in terms of structures. NATO is doing very well. The last years, I think the reforms have been significant. But we have problems with our democracies. And we need to So you're remember, talking about the member states yes, themselves? Yes, and I'm talking about member states. Uh, and I think we need to have a more direct conversation about how we fix this problem. You know, uh, this, uh, this video with Jamie was very educational because we all of a sudden remember how NATO and uh, the world looked like in 1989. And there was this Warsaw Pact to which my country belonged to, and the Warsaw Pact no longer exists and NATO does. And why is it? Is it because our institu the institutions are so good at NATO? Is it because there's a lot of Jamie Shees here? Is it because you know more, we're more efficient? No, because it's been an institution based not only on friendship, on alliances, but more importantly on values. And this institution can strive only if we continue to see this as a values-based institution. That is my personal belief. I know it's a personal belief of a lot of people who come here year after year uh, and also work on the many facets of, for example, public diplomacy, because NATO is also as strong as it has public support. And NATO has been lucky. It has a lot of sub public support in, in the countries. But we have to remember that that will also fade away the moment we start making serious compromises on who we are and what we stand for. Thank you very much. I mean, very I think well this done. is the energy we should take from today. Thank you. Um, maybe you come back tomorrow. Um, so I thank you very much for the whole day. I think we really had some great conversations. Um, who shall win tonight? Anyone else? England or Kosovo? Who is for England? You mean Croatia. Who is for England? Uh, excuse me, Croatia. <laughs> oh, gee. Who is for England? Okay. <laughs> Who will come back tomorrow? Okay, great. I think we should wrap it up. Can, I just, can I just say, if you're coming to the dinner, you will be able to see the match. So don't think you've got to go off somewhere else. Don't blame me if it doesn't work, but I'm told it will be happening. <laughs> so you can see it. There are four buses outside, and yes, they will transport you um, to the evening and other things which are going to happen after the match. It's going to be a tussle between food, football, and something else. But thank you all very much indeed. Okay. But let's keep the energy going tomorrow, please. Okay, thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>